So it is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thanks uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. This is in regards to the, the Canadian Armed Forces report that revealed that 26 residents died from dehydration and neglect in long-term care. Uh, back in uh, May, or early in May, a couple weeks ago, uh, May 6, the minister claimed that that matter had been investigated immediately. But then, on Friday, the Premier's minister said that an investigation was now underway. Well, the question is, is the Premier's minister now admitting that the full investigation that the Premier promised never happened? I think they need to answer that question, Speaker. To reply on behalf of the government, the government house leader. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As I uh, said last week, uh, of course, uh, uh, the coroner has been uh, engaged. Uh, we, uh, uh, through uh, both the uh, the commission uh, report, uh, uh, indeed through the auditor uh, general's report, uh, uh, we have been taking action on what we've seen in, in long-term care, Mr. Speaker. Obviously, we're very grateful uh, for the Canadian Armed Forces when they came uh, to assist us both here in Ontario uh, and in Quebec. Uh, but as I said last week, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, what both of these reports uh, highlight for us is the, uh, the massive amount of underfunding that took place in the system. Uh, uh, in the 15 years prior to us taking government. That's why we took immediate action uh, upon being elected, Mr. Speaker, to reform not only health care, to provide a, a blanket of care, the Ontario health teams that the minister brought in, which became important uh, uh, during uh, the, uh, the, the COVID response, outbreak, but investing in, in staffing, investing in new homes, upgrading some of those old, outdated homes. There's a lot of work still to do, Mr. Speaker, but we're well on our way to doing that. Thank you. Thank you. And the supplementary question. It seems very apparent that the Premier broke his, his promise. Families went through hell. The Premier promised an a full investigation. He promised it to family members. He promised it to survivors in long-term care. They were promised justice, and they got nothing, Speaker. The Canadian Armed Forces actually broke, a ring of silent, uh, broke the ring of silence, the iron ring of silence that was around long-term care. That's what was around long-term care, an iron ring of silence, and the CAF broke that, revealing horrors, people losing their lives to dehydration and neglect, people locked in their rooms, cockroach and other infestations uh, happening in these homes. And now the minister was claiming, is claiming that an investigation is suddenly underway. But that's the same claim she made last year and Question. was repeated earlier this month as well. On behalf of those families, will the government please acknowledge that the Premier broke his promise for a full investigation, a whole year has gone by. What is happening on that side of the House? Government House Leader. Uh, again, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, it's, the member will know, of course, that uh, the Premier uh, uh, undertook a commission uh, report uh, to help us identify some of the causes uh, uh, with respect to what happened in, in long-term care. We did that. I think we're one of the first governments in, in, in Canada uh, that has done this, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I, I recognize the fact that the, the members opposite were not in favour of, uh, of that commission, Mr. Speaker, but we've uh, not only have we started to act on some of the recommendations that came out of this report, but we've also engaged the corner. I think that's what uh, uh, members opposite would expect. I, I, I feel that's what the families would expect. But we have an obligation, not only to the families, Mr. Speaker, uh, of those who lost loved ones, but we have an obligation to future generations of this province to make sure that that doesn't happen again, to make sure that the investments are in place so that we have a long-term care system that is sustainable, that has the staffing that's required, Response. that has the beds. 30,000 beds, 27,000 uh, uh, new uh, staffing and nursing care in, in, in that. 2,000 new nurses just last week announced, Mr. Speaker, and four hours of care. We're well on our way to improving the system for future generations, and I hope the members will support us. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, I can certainly understand if families of residents in long-term care and the survivors don't believe a word the government says about investigations taking place. Let's face it, nearly a year ago, the Premier promised, and I'm going to quote, we, he claimed actually, we launched a full investigation. But the minister, his minister of long-term care, says that she only received the uh, Canadian Armed Forces reports on May the 6th, th this year, not last year, this year. 
Is the minister and the premier now claiming that, in fact, the Canadian Armed Forces withheld that information, or are they ready to admit that no full investigation took place, that that promise simply was broken by the premier? Uh, again, Speaker, I'm not sure where the Leader of the Opposition is coming from or where she has been. Now, I know that the members opposite were not in favour of the Commission of Inquiry that this government brought forward. It was a very important commission, Mr. Speaker, and we are acting on those recommendations. We did that. We did that because we wanted to assure those families who lost loved ones that action was going to be taken, that we would learn what happened in our homes. I am very grateful for the Canadian Armed Forces, for the actions that they took to help us in Ontario and in Quebec, Mr. Speaker. They did great work. But the, our priority now is not only justice for families, but it's making sure that future generations have the appropriate, appropriate long-term care, Mr. Speaker. For decades, long-term care was underfunded in this, uh, in this province. We're changing that. 30,000 new homes, over 27,000 uh, uh, more Response. additional staffing for the sector in four hours of care, leading North America in care, Mr. Speaker. We're out, well on our way to making sure this never happens again and having the best long-term care system in North America. Thank you. The next question, again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier, but I can assure the government that what families want is justice. They want justice and accountability. The government can't simply turn the, the page and pretend no nothing happened in long-term care. People were devastated. Lives were lost of de dehydration and neglect, Speaker. In fact, uh, residents were pleading for help in some of those long-term care homes. The ministry's own, the Minister of Long-Term Care's own uh, inspection reports at Downsview say this, and I quote, residents were not being fed appropriately or receiving sufficient fluids. That's from the minister's own internal report. So does the Premier and the Minister accept what the Canadian Armed Forces said happened in long-term care, that 26 people lost their lives to neglect and dehydration, or do they side with the for-profit owners of long-term care who said that that never happened and that the CAF made it up? Again, the government has to uh, Again, Mr. Speaker, this government will always side with the people of the province of Ontario. And that is why, Mr. Speaker, we launched a commission of inquiry so that we could understand what happened and what led uh, uh, to the, the tragedies in, in long-term care. The Auditor General did a similar report. And what we found, Mr. Speaker, is that yes, as I said on a number of occasions, we were put on the defense during the first and second waves of COVID. In fact, for the, very, for the full first year, Mr. Speaker, because of the lack of investments that had been made in the sector. We knew that, though. We knew that before the pandemic hit. That's why we made incredible investments in the sector to build new homes, renovate old homes, to make sure that we had a staffing solution. And that's why during the pandemic, we increased pay for those PSWs that were so important, Mr. Speaker. We brought in the armed forces. After the pandemic, as we start to come out of the pandemic, we're moving to four hours of care for residents, Mr. Speaker. We're hiring over 27,000 new PSWs, Mr. Speaker. We announced additional 2,000 nurses. It's before, during, and after, uh, Speaker. We are going to fix the system. We are going going to fix the system for the people of the province Fox. of Ontario, for future generations, and for those families who want justice, Mr. Speaker, it is there for them. Supplementary question. Speaker, you can't fix the system if you won't acknowledge what went wrong in long-term care. And the CAF said 26 people died of dehydration and neglect, and this government refuses to acknowledge that that happened. In fact, the Minister of Long-Term Care, on the one hand, says that that there was a full investigation that had taken place. And now she's saying that she's learning of these details for the very first time. Well, both can't be true at the same time, Speaker. Either there was an investigation and she knew about it, or she's learning about it for the first time. That leaves a lot of questions in families' minds. I have to say, a year has gone by, a whole year. There has been no justice. There's been no charges. There's been no true investigation. People deserve so much better than this, Speaker. Does this government believe what families are saying? Do they uh, plan to give families the justice Question. they need? And if not, how are families going to in any way trust that this government is going to give them the answers they deserve? Again, Speaker, that is why we, uh, we moved very quickly 
to have a commission of inquiry. Now, the Leader of the Opposition will know that she has stood in her place on many occasions and was against that commission of inquiry, Mr. Speaker. But we knew that it was very important for the families uh, who had lost loved ones during, the, during uh, uh, the COVID crisis. But we knew also, Mr. Speaker, that in order to make sure that future generations did not go through this again, that we had to make serious investments in the sector. That's why we are moving to four hours of care. That's why after the first wave, Mr. Speaker, despite the fact Despite the fact that we did not get the vaccines that we needed in February, March, and April, we made a commitment to long-term care to ensure that they were the first people vaccinated in this province, Speaker. But it's more than that. It's more than that. For the families, Mr. Speaker, justice is about making sure that future generations Response? never go through this again. It is a responsibility of this legislature that we do that, and that's why we are making sure with the investments that we're making that it does not happen again. The Commission of Inquiry, the Auditor General's Report, helped guide us, Mr. Speaker, and we will not fail them. And the final supplementary. Speaker, justice has not been served to the victims, the, the, the people who, were, who lost their lives in long-term care, their family members. They have not had justice. And for this minister to suggest that the, the, the chapter is now closed, that the inquiry report has been issued, and now everything just starts from zero again is a complete disservice to all of the suffering that took place and that still takes place from, with the family members of people who survived and people who lost their lives. So the question I have for this government is when are they going to acknowledge that justice has to occur, that there has to be accountability, that the people who lost their lives to neglect, dehydration, abandonment need and deserve justice and this government has to do right by them. How can anybody in Ontario Question. trust this government if they don't do right by all of those tragedies that occurred over the years? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and let me assure uh, uh, the people of the province of Ontario that the book will never be closed because we understand how important it is to make investments in long-term care, not only for those who lost loved ones, Mr. Speaker. That is why the coroner has been engaged. That is why we had a commission of inquiry. But let me remind the leader of the opposition, when she had the opportunity between 2011 and 2014 to make long-term care a priority, she chose to accept a stretch goal in insurance, Mr. Speaker. What did we do? Upon getting elected, Mr. Speaker, we moved very quickly uh -huh. to make investments in long-term care home. We knew that we could not uh, end hallway health care without making investments in long-term care. The Minister of Health brought in Ontario health teams, which were so effective in ridings like mine, where hospitals came in to help congregate care settings, came in to help our long-term care homes. We were making these investments and making the Response? changes prior to the pandemic during the pandemic and after the pandemic, we will live up to the responsibility that for 15 years never happened in this place, and we will make long-term care better for future generations. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you, and good morning, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, in Brampton, basketball courts are locked shut. The nets have been taken down. Tennis courts and cricket pitches are all taped off. And across the province, golf courses and other safe outdoor activities sit empty. Despite the fact that medical experts never recommended closing these places in the first place. Speaker, my question to the Premier. It's clear that no one asked for this. Not the science table, not the medical experts, not Ontarians. No one thinks this is a good idea. Why won't this government do the right thing, Speaker, and vote with us to safely reopen outdoor activities? To reply, Mr. Tuck. Thank you very much, Speaker. Well, we're not able to do that right now because our numbers are still too high in our hospitalizations. The Ontario Hospital Association is not in favour of opening all outdoor activities at this point. Our numbers are still high in intensive care units. Today, they stand at 779. That's a very high level. It's come down a little bit, but it's still a very high level. Notwithstanding that, Speaker, Parks are open. People still can go out. We want people to go out. The weather is getting better. Please go out. Go for a walk. Go for a run. Walk the dog. Let the kids go run in the park. All of that can still happen. That is the way we have to do this in order that our hospitals remain able to take in all the people that they need to take in and that we don't let this variant of concern take over again because the last thing we want is a fourth wave in Ontario, which would be devastating for the province. 
The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Well, Speaker, the science table actually recommends that uh, Conservatives close non-essential workplaces, for example, and pay people to stay home and actually have a real paid sick days plan here instead of closing down our playgrounds and parks. They said that two uh, weeks of sick days were essential to help stop the spread and keep people safe, yet the Conservatives ignore that advice as well. The science table also recommends that if we don't let people participate in safe outdoor activities, you're potentially forcing them inside where the risk of spread is even higher, and that this negatively impacts people's mental health and well-being. Order. Speaker. So again, Speaker, I think it's important that we highlight that this is an equity issue. Not everyone has access to a backyard that they can roll around in. So Again, Speaker, the question to the Premier is, the science table, medical experts like the Ontario Medical Association, the Canadian Pediatric Society have been clear. We question. need to safely reopen our outdoor recreation amenities and activities. Will the Premier stop listening to his buddies and start listening to the experts and open up outdoor recreation and amenities immediately? Well, it's our responsibility to act appropriately, given the information that we have, to be responsible because we are responsible for protecting the health and well-being of all Ontarians, which we have done. We do encourage people to go outdoors. The weather is beautiful. Please don't stay inside all day. Go out and get some exercise. There's still many ways you can do it. Parks are open. There's still Order. trails are open. There's still many, many things that people can do, and we encourage people to be outdoors. But that we are, and, and we are proceeding with our vaccinations as well. We've got over seven million people over the age of 18 vaccinated already. This isn't a forever situation, but for right now, we need to follow the health advice which we've received from the chief medical officer, Order. and we need to continue following public health place, health and uh, workplace Member for Brampton measures, Center, come which to we order. will continue to do. The House will come to order. The next question, the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. Our government has been asking for increased international and domestic border measures to stop the spread of COVID-19 for weeks now. These urgent requests to the federal government are backed up by hard evidence and data. This isn't just about international travellers. COVID-19 enters Ontario from other provinces, too. When we push the federal government to do their part, it's important that Ontarians know that their provincial government is doing everything in its power to stop COVID-19 from entering the province as well. So, can the Solicitor General remind the House of what our government is doing to protect our borders from incoming COVID variants of concern? Great question. The Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker. You know, the member from Brantford Brant is absolutely right. This is why our government took an extraordinary step this spring and issued an emergency order restricting travel into Ontario through land and water crossings from the provinces of Manitoba and Quebec. We continue to advocate for the federal government to restrict travel through federally regulated aviation. Premier Ford has repeatedly asked the federal government to step up and do their job. In our most recent letter, we asked the federal government for three things, four things, a ban on all non-essential travel, mandatory PSR testing for interprovincial travel, an end to the loophole at the land borders, and proper enforcement of hotel quarantine. We continue to be clear to the federal government. We're imploring them to take stricter measures to protect our borders. Thank you, Speaker. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Ontarians need to understand how important further action at our borders is needed. Some Ontarians presume that after over a year of the pandemic, there would have been some sort of safeguards put in place by the federal government. We need to protect Ontario from incoming travellers, whether domestic or international. Back to the minister. Can she provide any examples of why we are concerned about keeping non-essential travellers out of the province? Again, the Solicitor General to respond. Thank you, and thank you again for the uh, member from Brent for Brent. You know, in January, Ontario had 173 international travellers who tested positive for COVID-19 at Pearson. In February, the numbers jumped to 585 positive cases identified in international travellers at Pearson. The cases didn't slow the next month either. In fact, the numbers almost doubled in March to 943. And in April, 
Unfortunately, we recorded our highest number yet this year with a whopping 1,439 international travellers testing positive. That's over 3,000 international positive cases in 2021 so far, each one sitting beside another traveller on the plane and potentially interacting with others in their community. Ontario is taking all the steps that it can to stop the spread of COVID-19. When will the federal government do their job? The next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. This question is for the Premier. Speaker, a new survey of teachers conducted by the CBC highlights again what we've been saying over and over. After more than a year of disruption and a failure of this government to support students or keep schools safely opened, our kids are not okay. 70% of survey respondents from boards in Hamilton, Halton, Niagara, Brantford worry that students won't catch up academically. In Waterloo Region, more than half of the teachers are worried students aren't meeting learning objectives and more and more aren't showing up at all. Every expert says we need to put in place more supports, more interventions. Speaker, why is the government going back to pre-COVID funding levels for our schools? Why aren't our children their priority? To reply, the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Uh, on the contrary, in fact, the government of Ontario, under the Premier's leadership, has put in place a $2 billion enhanced allocation because we're assuming in September, while we look forward to a world with vaccines being uh, provided to all Canadians, all Ontarians that want one, 18 and up, effective tomorrow, we also realize that we have to be cautious, which is why we funded $1.6 billion. The differentiator between this $1.6 billion for September and the last is this September's funding is entirely driven by the province. There's an additional $85 million for specifically for a learning recovery, a four times 400% increase of mental health support when compared to the former Liberal government in 2017-18. More funding for ventilation, further improvements beyond the 95% within our schools that have upgraded it as a consequence of our investments and our guidance. We're going to continue to work with the Chief Medical Officer of Health, but yes, most importantly, put in place the funding to ensure students and staff remain safe this September. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker. On the contrary, this government is flatlining education funding for the next year. They've given up, and the only thing they're promising Ontarians is more of the same terrible situation we've been in for more than a year. Stretched school boards are being forced to turn to this so-called hybrid learning model, where the same teacher is asked to divide their time and attention between kids in class and those at home. This model is pushing teachers to the breaking point, and I'll tell you, it means a lot less direct support for our students. They won't get to learn outside where we know it's safer because their teacher is going to be on the computer with students at home. Speaker, why is this premier still trying to cut corners at the expense of our children's education and their well-being? Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we have put in place $1.6 billion, which has helped us uh, hire over 7,000 additional staff this year, helped us improve 95 per cent of air ventilation systems within the schools of this province, $700 additional million dollars for air ventilation improvements in partnership with the federal government is being, uh, being implemented as we speak, Mr. Speaker. We've doubled the mental health allocation for our nurses. Uh, uh, rather double the public health nurses within our schools and four times increase in mental health. And Mr. Speaker, you know, it has to be said, if the member opposite uh, was given the privilege to serve in government, their party and that of the other opposition parties aligned with the teacher unions would not have reopened schools in 2021 at all. Absolutely contrary to the best interests of mental health of children. We're on the side of parents and kids. We're listening to the expert. Our aim is to get these schools open as soon as it is safe, Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Long-Term Care. On Friday, it came to light that Ministry of Long-Term Care inspectors documented evidence of dehydration and malnutrition in one long-term care home back in June 2020, almost a year ago. These findings align, align with the Armed Forces report that 26 residents died in that home from dehydration. The Premier said at the time, There'll be a full investigation, and any results will be turned over to police. Well, the Solicitor General confirmed last week that that investigation never happened. So, Speaker, through you, 
If ministry inspectors documented signs of resident neglect last year in a home where 26 people died from dehydration, why has it taken the minister almost a full year to launch an investigation? To reply on behalf of the government, the government house leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. But as I just said, obviously there is a, a commission of inquiry which the Premier set up uh, uh, very quickly, Mr. Speaker. In fact, during the pandemic, we set up a, a, a commission inquiry. I know that the Auditor General has uh, uh, has also re reviewed this, and the coroner has uh, has been engaged, Mr. Speaker. But let's look at where we were when we took government, uh, Mr. Speaker. A decade and a half of liberal inaction on long-term care led us to a situation that put us on the defense for the better part of a year in this province. But what have we done? We said we were going to end health, hallway health care. How are we doing that? By increasing ICU capacity. They left us with one of the lowest in, uh, in North America. We increased testing from 5,000 to 75,000 so that we can track COVID quicker, Mr. Speaker. We increased funding for long-term care, rebuilding old outdated homes, building 30,000 new homes over the, the, over the coming years, adding staffing up to 27,000 new PSWs, four hours of care, Mr. Speaker. Despite the broken legacy of the previous Liberal government, we're getting the job done for today's seniors and for future generations. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, but the government's stories on this, quite frankly, I've been going through them, are dizzy. And here are some of the comments from the Armed Forces members. The facility should be shut down. Incompetent staff should be fired and management should be charged. What is happening is criminal. Other comments include terrible, a shit pit, horrifying. The test, in testimony before the Long-Term Care Commission in October 2020, Humber River Hospital CEO Barbara Collins noted that food and water challenges had contributed to deaths at at least one home and contributed and suggested the military knew that was the case. So, Speaker, it's hard to believe that the minister only became aware of these serious allegations two weeks ago. The timeline just doesn't add up. And the bottom line is those 26 families and many others who lost a loved one deserve justice. Justice, not a game of hide and seek. So, Speaker, through you, can the minister explain why she was so unaware that she is only now launching an investigation that was promised more than a year ago? Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, this is a member, this is a member who sat in a government for 15 years underfunded long-term care, did not bring in a staffing strategy, did not bring in the hours of care that was, uh, that was required, Order. whose lack of decision-making left Order. the province of Ontario on the defence for a year while we rebuild ICU capacity, while we built up testing capacity, Mr. Speaker. This is the legacy of the previous Liberal government to which he was a member, Mr. Speaker. We moved right away to end that legacy, previous Liberal legacy, of, uh, of ignoring long-term care. 30,000 new spaces, 27,000 new PSWs, increasing ICU capacity, Mr. Speaker. We're getting the job done for people, for the people of the province of Ontario, a job that they so miserably failed, Response. Mr. Speaker. We will get it do done, unlike the previous Liberal government, to which he was a member of for 15 years. The House will come to order. The next question, the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Heritage, Sports, Tourism and Culture Industries. Over the course of this pandemic, we have seen the industries that this minister represents hit the hardest, and we know that they will likely take the longest to recover. We are over a year into this pandemic and are heading into the summer months which many tourism and travel small businesses rely on for critical revenue every year. These small businesses are in dire need of financial support, and I know this minister just made an announcement of a new tourism and travel small business grant last week, and I am hopeful the minister can tell us more about this new program and elaborate on who is eligible and how they can apply. Great question. Mr. Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. Speaker, and thanks to the member for raising this important question. He and I had an opportunity to travel across his great riding uh, last summer when we had a bit of a reprieve um, from COVID-19. It's true, many of the industries and sectors that I represent have been closed for over 400 days. And that's why, in an unprecedented show of support to these sectors, almost a billion dollars in supports will be leveraged through this ministry, but through other ministries, to support our hardest-hit sectors 
in heritage, sport, tourism and culture industries. Uh, on May 13th, we launched this $100 million app grant application that will run until June, June 25th for up to ten dollars to $20,000 in one-time grants that can be used for rent, for hiring staff, for marketing, for the like. I'm pre pleased to say, on behalf of all of my government colleagues, that almost 1,000 people have applied since last Thursday. Um, over 200 travel agents who weren't captured in previous supports received it. Nearly 200 hotels and motels Response. and nearly 200 hunting and fishing lodges. There will be more to say in the supplemental. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister. This sounds like a great program and a great opportunity for these small businesses in the province, which is needed and well-deserved. Every eligible business in the province should have the opportunity to apply for this grant. What is our government doing to ensure these businesses are aware of the grant and have the support they need to apply? Great question. <laughs> Minister to reply. Have a role to play in the hardest hit sectors in supporting them, and I can say this: uh, we have had over 15 telephone town halls with the sectors. I have a tourism, economic development, and recovery task force, which will be reporting back soon. And of course, we had almost a thousand people from the sector um, on a call on Thursday to tell them how to actually access the portal. We also did a government-wide um, town hall for uh, government members. I was pleased to say over 100 to staff and MPPs showed up, but was very disappointed when the NDP and the Liberals and the Green parties only uh, showed up two people um, for these hard to, hardest hit sectors. And I have to say, when you look at Niagara Falls, when you look at Northern Ontario, when you look at Ottawa, when you look at Toronto, when you look at Hamilton, all really important places to visit in this province, their members didn't show up. And I have to say, there's $100 million there. Fine. We all have a role to play in terms of supporting them. And I call on the members opposite to do their jobs. The next question, the member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Tomorrow, officials at PCAB will accept or reject Charles McVitie's plan to grant arts and science degrees at his so-called university. Ironically, today is the International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia and Transphobia, and it's troubling that this application has gotten this far. In the fall, this government rushed legislation through so the Premier's close friend could build a university for his hateful rhetoric, particularly against LGBTQ2S communities and Muslim Ontarians. While PCAB requested extensive changes and had numerous questions for Mr. McVitie, Canada Christian College's CEO, Mr. McVitie's son, flew to Disney World this winter instead of responding. This delayed the process by four months. The McVities had to ask for not one, but two extensions. So tomorrow, PCAB will finally give them a yes or no. So and through you, Mr. Speaker, and to the Premier, if PCAB denies the Charles McVitie University, will he immediately introduce legislation to stop them in their tracks? The Parliamentary Assistant, Member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for that question. Speaker, as we've said uh, time and time again, this government respects the independent advice of our post-secondary PCAB process. Speaker, it's thanks to this process that we've seen, we've seen independence given to places like Algoma University. It's thanks to these independent processes that we've seen greater autonomy for our institutions in the North granting degrees and better unlocking the potential of a next generation of healthcare professionals in the North, better unlocking the next generation of Francophone leaders in the North, Indigenous leaders in the North. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to respecting independent processes, this government will always do that. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and back to the Premier. Charles McVitie hosted a mask-free event at his college last month with hundreds in attendance and video showed there was no social distancing. It seems following the science table is not something that Charles McVitie is willing to do. Now, my office has received numerous emails indicating in no uncertain terms that members of Ontario's post-secondary community do not believe that Charles McVitie should be offering arts and science degrees, not when he ignores the public health guidelines, and especially given his rhetoric against LGBTQ2S and Muslim communities. And yet this Premier continues to bend over backwards every time Charles McVitie asks for a favour. So through you, Mr. Speaker, and back to the Premier, will the government immediately bring in legislation to rescind Charles McVitie's university before the session breaks for the summer? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Mr. Speaker, this is about an independent process. This is about an independent process that this government supports. Mr. Speaker, if it was up to the members opposite, it would be politicians interfering in the independent process designed to support institutions in the north. It would be politicians deciding what Order. courses are and aren't offered, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, that member might be competing with her colleagues to audition for Minister of Thought Control. But in this side, Mr. Speaker, we're going to respect independent Order. processes. We're going to respect independent processes that have unlocked the potential for those learners in the north that I mentioned, Mr. Speaker. It's this government that lowered tuition for university students, Mr. Speaker. It's this government that's expanded OSEP eligibility for our Indigenous learner, that's launched independent uh, processes for our Indigenous institutes, Mr. Speaker, for those important partners that we work with to unlock the potential in Northern Ontario. Mr. Mr. Speaker, what does that member have in common with all those things? She voted against every one of those measures to support our post-secondary learners. Thank you, Speaker. The next question, the member for Don Valley West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Um, Speaker, as we move to the end of the school year, I recognize that there are going to be some discussions about whether in the next couple of weeks we can open schools for some time. But my question has to do with the broader issue of what happens in our schools in September. One of the hallmarks of this government's decisions on schooling has been a puzzling reluctance to actually talk with the people who are teaching our children and grandchildren. In the same way that it's important to talk with doctors and nurses who represent the doctors and nurses of this province to glean their advice, it's important that decision makers talk with teachers and support staff who have been working so hard this year to keep our students engaged. Mr. Speaker, can the Premier tell this legislature and the people of Ontario whether he and his Minister of Education have met with the leadership of the teachers' federations and the support staff unions at any time since last July, almost a year ago, in order to plan for the beginning of the school year Question. this coming September, and if not, when will he do so? Minister of Education. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, indeed, the Ministry of Education regularly meets with our Federation partners. Just last week, I would have met with the Principals Associations, both of English and uh, of English and French, Catholic and public, likewise of the Trustees Associations, representing all uh, associations in the province, and as well as CODE, the Directors of Education Council. So we have, we're in constant contact listening to their perspective, but of course listening to the Chief Medical Officer of Health, sick kids and other pediatric institutions, giving us guidance on how to reduce uh, any potential spread and maximize safety as we look to September. It's why the government announced $1.6 billion, a nation-leading plan of investment, $2 billion overall, increase in the grant for student need, and a one-time increase in COVID resources, more support for for uh, reading recovery and math recovery, recognizing the challenges of this disruption, m a historic investment in mental health, and of course, Response. a choice for parents of in-class and online learning this September. We think that is an important and positive plan as we look forward to September. And the supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, just to be clear, that answer was a no, because directors and um, trustees and administrators are not teachers. They are not support staff, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, my question was, has the Premier and his minister, have they met with the people who actually represent the people who are in the classroom with our students, Mr. Order. Speaker. And that is, it's a puzzling reluctance, I, I will say again, Mr. Speaker, because those are the people who hear from their members, who hear from the front line. That's where the information should come from, Mr. Speaker. It's my understanding that from a news report that at a recent cabinet meeting, there was a preoccupation with the discussion about the golf industry. Mr. Speaker, I have nothing against golf. My partner, Jane, is an avid golfer. But, Mr. Speaker, how is it possible that understanding the intricacies of the golf industry is more important than Question. understanding what goes on in our schools from teachers and support staff? Or Will the Premier and the Minister develop an ongoing and frequent dialogue with the people who represent the literally hundreds of thousands of adults who work with the children of this province, Mr. Speaker? Stop the clock. Okay. We're not going to have that this morning. If it continues, I'll call you out by name, and if necessary, I'll warn you, and if necessary, send you home. Please start the clock. Minister of Education. 
Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Look, it's uh, one thing to listen to teacher unions and federation. It's another thing to be entirely beholden to them. In the example of Regulation 274, when the member opposite permitted teacher unions to hire exclusively based on seniority union, yes, they were listening to the teacher unions and they were ignoring parents in this province. And that's why this government ended that regulation entirely. I just scolded one side of the house. The same thing applies to the other side of the house. Minister of Education, please conclude your response. Uh, thank you, Speaker. In addition, we've listened to parents who said, look, they want a choice this September for in-class and online learning, recognizing the majority are going to choose in-class as they should, as we support that development that is stimulated in an in-class environment. It's also why we listen to parents in the context of providing mental health supports, as they've realized the disruption has had a challenge on their child's health. We quadrupled the investment from when the former Liberal government was in power in 1718 because we recognize we want to reduce wait times, increase support, Spons? and early intervention. It's why we listen to parents as well with a $1.6 billion plan, taking, uh, making every precaution and investing every dollar to ensure students are safe. Thank you. Next question, the member for Brantford Grant. Speaker, we know that there is a gap between the number of nurses that we currently have and future needs of our health care system. This is particularly true in sectors where frontline workers care for our most vulnerable patients, such as long-term care, home and community care, and acute care. Speaker, I am proud that our government has committed to addressing the challenges in long-term care by committing to an average of four hours of direct care. Of course, we need more nurses to deliver on that province. So can the Minister of Colleges and Universities tell us what actions the government is taking to increase the number of registered nurses and registered practical nurses in Ontario? Member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for that important question. Mr. Speaker, it was because of the leadership of uh, Premier Ford, Minister of Long-Term Care, and the Minister of Colleges and Universities that this government may announce a historic $35 million to increase enrollment in nursing in our publicly assisted universities and colleges. This will result in an additional 1,130 practical nurses and over 870 registered nurses. Mr. Speaker, this is the first increase, the first increase in nursing seats in over 20, yes, 20 years, Speaker. It's truly historic. But, Speaker, we're also increasing clinical placements so that we can ensure that our next generation of learners have the hands-on experience they need. Speaker, after decades and decades of neglect, this government understands that these important Spons? investments are needed to give our healthcare professionals of tomorrow the important experience that they need to better support Ontarians today and tomorrow. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary question. Speaker, it is great news that the government is continuing to take real action to hire more frontline health care workers to support our long-term care and health care system. I am sure that the minister agrees that we cannot stop there. There are challenges with the supply of frontline staff like PSWs as well. We also know that nursing education isn't always accessible for prospective students because of where they live. Can the minister explain how this announcement about training more nurses fits into the broader work with colleges and universities to increase the supply of health care workers in Ontario? Thank you, Speaker. That member is absolutely right. And Speaker, one of the reasons I got involved in, uh, in seeking election after working in the health care sector was because of after years of systemic neglect, Mr. Speaker, after years under which we weren't thinking outside the box to better unlock our learners of tomorrow and our well-trained health care professionals of tomorrow. That's why 2,000 additional nurses is so badly needed. Mr. Speaker, that's why we've also launched free tuition at our public and private colleges to support over 16 thousand PSWs. Mr. Speaker, together this will support our goal of hiring over 27,000 more 
healthcare professionals to support in achieving a four hours of direct care. Mr. Speaker, that will place us as a leader in Canada in terms of direct hours of care to support our loved ones, loved ones like my grandparents that fell victim to a neglected system. Mr. Speaker, of all political parties, but it's thanks to investments of this Premier Response. and this government that we will ensure that Ontarians of today and Ontarians of tomorrow are better looked after. Thank you, Speaker. The next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Citizens across Ontario were horrified when the Premier refused to open outdoor recreational activities based on an anecdotal story about his buddies going for a few pops after a game of golf. Despite calls from the municipal leaders, health experts, the Ontario Medical Association and their own science table, this government has continued to keep outdoor recreation closed. The scientific director of Ontario's COVID-19 science advisory table has said that outdoor activities like golf, tennis and beach vo vo volleyball are low risk and that uh, with uh, some additional instruction, the province could allow people to once again participate in sports. I've heard from hundreds of people in Niagara, some of whom voted for this government. They tell me that lockdowns have had a devastating impact on their mental health and ask that outdoor activities that can be done safely be opened up. Will the Premier Question. listen to science, support the member from Brampton Centre's motion and safely reopen outdoor recreational activities? Mr. Hill. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. We obviously encourage people to go outdoors. Please enjoy this wonderful weather. Go outside, take a walk, go for a bike ride, go play with your grandchildren outside, garden if you're able to. There's lots of activities that people can do safely, but today is not the day to open up all outdoor recreational activities. We are reviewing the evidence on a daily basis, speaking with Dr. Williams and other, others of our medical advisors. All of our decisions are based on the data and the clinical evidence, but today is not the day to do it. It may be very soon, it may be June 2nd or perhaps even before that, but today is not the day to open everything up. Supplementary. Speaker, that's not what the science says. The people of Ontario are sick and tired of hearing the Premier's anecdotes about cheesecake, egg sandwiches and his buddies having a few pops while he ignores scientific evidence and advice. Andrew and Jennifer own the Brock Golf Course in my riding and are struggling to pay the bills with only a few precious months ahead to earn revenue when the weather is good. They know they're not the only small business suffering and they've more, they're more than willing to do their part, but they don't understand why they can't serve the public when there is no scientific explanation why they are not permitted to safely operate. This is a golf course where seniors, kids, and people of all ages and skill levels can get out and enjoy the fresh air in a safe environment. These safe outdoor activities are important to the people of my riding and people across Ontario. When will the Premier finally listen to science, admit he got it wrong Question. again, and open safe outdoor recreational activities? Mr. Hill. Thank you, Speaker. Well, since the beginning of this pandemic, the health and well-being of all Ontarians has been our primary responsibility and our primary focus. It will continue to be. We are listening to the medical experts, including Dr. Williams, our Chief Medical Officer of Health, and the 34 medical health officers in all the public health unit regions across the province. We listen to what they're saying. We do encourage people to be outdoors. Enjoy this weather. It's getting more beautiful each and every day. But today is not the day to open everything up. I believe that would be irresponsible for us to do that today. But we are following the evidence on a daily basis, and it will happen on or before June 2nd. Thank you. The next question, the member for Guelph. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. The science is clear. Most COVID outbreaks are happening in vulnerable, essential workplaces, and outdoor activities are safe and should be open. That's why for weeks I've been urging the Premier to focus on where the outbreaks are happening, vulnerable workplaces, and to reopen safe outdoor activities. This is an equity issue, Speaker. Not everyone has a yard to play in. Not everyone can work from home. So, Speaker, will the Premier follow the advice of scientists and public health experts by opening safe outdoor activities and focusing in on where the virus is spreading, vulnerable indoor workplaces. 
Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. We are encouraging people to be outdoors. We encourage parks are open, trails are open. People can be outdoors to enjoy it, walking, biking, uh, whatever they wish to do, taking the dog out for a walk. People can be outdoors. They, the, I understand what you're saying with respect to equity, but with all due respect, parks are open to everyone to be out and enjoy. So there is no uh, equity issue here in terms of availability of outdoor spaces. People can be outdoors and we encourage them to do so. But today is not the day to open up everything. We are watching this on a daily basis. This time will come. Uh, this is not forever, but today is not the day. Supplementary. Speaker, trust, public trust is vital to combating COVID. And trust is built when you make decisions based on evidence and science. Most of the spread is happening in vulnerable workplaces, not outdoors, not by travel. Yet the Premier seems to be focusing all of his energy on closing outdoor activities and blaming the federal government for his mistakes. So, Speaker, I'm asking the Premier to make a pivot today. Will the Premier start focusing on what experts are calling the blind spot in the government's response to COVID and mandate medical grade PPE in vulnerable indoor workplaces and mandate that they have proper ventilation in vulnerable workplaces? Minister of Labor, Training and Skills Development. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. The health and safety uh, of every single worker uh, in this province is our government's uh, top priority. That's why, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we've done now more than 50,000 uh, inspections and investigations related to COVID-19 in workplaces uh, across the province. We've uh, now issued uh, more than 55,000 uh, orders to improve uh, conditions in those workplaces, and uh, we've now shut down uh, 91 unsafe uh, workplaces and job sites across uh, the province. But, uh, Mr. Speaker, we've gone even further. We've now hired uh, more than 100 new health and safety uh, inspectors. That brings uh, the ministry's inspectorate to the largest number uh, in provincial history. We have uh, more than 200 uh, guidance documents and posters and tip sheets and videos in dozens and dozens of uh, languages available at Ontario.ca forward slash COVID safety. Mr. Speaker, we'll continue to protect the health and safety of every single worker in this province. Thank you. The next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you so much, Speaker. There are three provincially designated hotspots and one additional hotspot, the M4Y postal code, um, that's been prioritized by our local hospital despite being omitted by this provincial government from the list um, in my community in Toronto Centre. So four hotspots in total in a riding that is barely more than seven square kilometres large. Tens of thousands of people in my community are at incredibly high risk of contracting COVID-19 because of our skyrocketing rates, uh, these hotspot zones, and the incredibly dense nature of our community. For weeks, this government has held back vaccines from hotspots. It was nearly impossible to find an appointment. People were, call were calling it the vaccine hunger games in my community speaker. Over the past week, we have finally started to receive a steady supply of vaccines and are beginning to curb the deadly outbreaks that are just ravaging our downtown neighbourhoods. We're just starting to get the situation under control. But my question to the Premier is, why is he ignoring the advice of Ontario's science table and planning to pull that concentrated support from these hotspots in just two weeks, putting the safety of the entire province at risk? Minister of Labour, come to order. Minister of Health, to reply. Thank you, Speaker. In fact, our plan to allocate 50% uh, of the incoming vaccines to the hotspot areas over two weeks has been very successful, and we do have a reliable and steady supply of vaccines coming in. But I can certainly advise the member that uh, because of this plan, we have now seen due to this allocation of vaccines to hotspots that the hotspot areas now have 7.9 percent more coverage than the non-hotspot community so i would call that success and now we're going to continue to roll out the vaccine supply which we have almost double the supply of vaccines coming in now than we had before and that is available to each public health unit to allocate the uh, vaccines according to their own definition of their hotspots supplementary Thank you, Speaker. I'm asking the minister to listen to the science table. And Ontario's science table gave this government clear direction that at least 50 per cent of vaccines need to go to the 74 hotspot areas for no less than 25 days, two weeks 
14 days, does not 25 days make the minimum standard recommendation that is coming from Ontario's science table? There are still too many people in these hotspots who haven't received their first doses. If this government takes vaccinations out of those hotspots now too early, we risk taking the province entirely backwards on our vaccination strategy. Why is the Premier refusing to do what the experts at the science table are telling him uh, and to stop the cycle of lockdowns by adequately maintaining the hotspot strategy for the minimum 25 days that was recommended by the science table? Mr. Hill. Thank you, Speaker. Well, the plan that we had to increase the vaccine supply to those hotspot areas by 50 percent has been successful. Overall, virtually an 8 percent higher dosage rate in the hotspot communities versus the non-hotspot communities. In addition to that, at the time that the allocation and the recommendation was made by the science table was when our vaccine supplies were much lower. Now we have almost double the supply of vaccines coming into all areas across the province now. The designation is going to be by population and by risk, so those areas that are still at risk still will receive more vaccines, and it is entirely due to the discretion of the local medical officers of health to have those vaccines concentrated in the areas that are still considered to be hotspot areas. So we have more than adequate supply. I have confidence in the uh, ability of the public health officers to make those decisions, Response? and people will be receiving much higher levels of doses of those vaccines. Thank you. The next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. My question is to the Minister of Health. Um, I was listening to you very carefully because you know that in hotspot areas like in my community of Scarborough Guildwood, the test positivity still remains very high. In fact, in the Morningside area alone, the test positivity is 1,200 per 100,000 people, which is 10 times higher than the provincial average. So that is a risk that you've just said that hot spots where there is risk will receive more. So my question to you is how much more? The Ontario Science Table says that hot spots should receive 50% more of the allocated vaccines. So it doesn't make sense to go back to a per capita distribution as if everyone bears the same risk because we do not. Our communities that have high rates of positivity require more vaccines because that is safer for the whole province. Question. We get the third wave under control. So um, my question is simply, will you listen to the science table and go back to the 50 per cent allocation? Thank you. The reply, Mr. Pell. Well, you're absolutely right. The test rates do remain very high in certain parts of the province, which is why we need to be very, very careful about any potential reopening, which has been argued on that side all morning. That is why we need to be very careful, and we are being careful. The strategy that we brought forward to allocate 50 per cent of the vaccines into those hotspots is working, already an 8 per cent higher level in hotspot communities versus non-hotspot communities. But we need to continue to uh, acts, uh, allocate the vaccines, which we are doing based on population, as we were before, but also based on risk. So the areas that have higher risk areas are going to receive more vaccines, which would, of course, include Scarborough. Supplementary. So my, my, what I'm seeking an answer to is how much more allocation will the communities like Scarborough receive? They need to know that. Um, for serious reasons. So when we look at um, the expansion of vaccines to 18 plus across the province, that's good news. And, and I think that that's good. But over the weekend, I spoke to uh, a gentleman in my riding. He's 96 years old. His name is James. And he lives, he's, he, he lives by himself. He's homebound. He does not leave his home. But he has support that comes into his home through the Lynn. And he is still waiting for his vaccine, despite being eligible for the past five months as part of phase one. And James demonstrates that now is not the time to turn our focus away from the hotspots, because we still have vulnerable people who remain in the communities who are at serious risk. Question. So, Speaker, there are thousands of homebound residents like James living in hotspots who are still waiting for their turn and want to know Will the minister commit to 50 per cent more vaccine supply to hotspot communities? The minister of Health. Thank you. Going forward, the uh, vaccine allocation will be based on population and based on risk. I know that Scarborough has had 
a number of hotspot areas and will continue to do so, but it's, all areas are now receiving much larger quantities of vaccines because we now do have a reliable and steady supply of vaccines, and we want to make sure that people such as James do receive their first dose. So we are working with our paramedic services, with our home care services as well, to make sure that everybody who wants to receive a vaccine will receive a vaccine. So James will not be missed out. He will receive his first dosage and his second dosage at the appropriate time. The next question, the member for Humber River, Black Creek. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Thousands of small businesses in my community and across Ontario have been forced to lock down during the stay-at-home order. These businesses have been doing their part to slow down the spread of COVID-19, but without help from this government, they risk losing everything they have worked so hard for through no fault of their own. Many local small business owners have contacted my office frustrated with the lack of transparency from this government regarding the Ontario Small Business Support Grant Program. They listened to this government and applied for the grant and patiently waited for weeks, only to be denied with no explanation given. When they tried to contact this government's call centre, they still couldn't get an answer. Now the program deadline is closed, with countless thousands of businesses still needing the support to keep their lights on and their doors open. Why is this government hanging these small business owners out to dry? To reply, the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you very much for the question. First of all, Speaker, we are absolutely thrilled that 109,700 small businesses in Ontario were, uh, have received almost $3 billion. In fact, it's $2.82 billion already, Speaker. That is an unprecedented Order. amount of money that has gone out in three and a half months from this government to the, to the small businesses, and we're very, very upset to see that the NDP did not support the doubling of that small business grant. That was one of the billion come to dollars order. that they held, that they voted to hold back from the small businesses. We're very sad to see that they did not support the new grant in the budget for the small Response. business tourism and travel groups as well, Speaker. Very disappointed. Maybe. <laughs> Point of order. Government House Leader. Right, Mr. Speaker, I hope the, the House will indulge me. I'd just like to wish uh, uh, my Chief of Staff, Jessica Lippert, I know a lot of you who have served here for a long time will know her. Jessica celebrated her 30th uh, birthday, Mr. Speaker, so I just want to wish her a very happy birthday. Thank you. We have a deferred vote on the motion for second reading of Bill 277, an act to amend the Ministry of Health and Long Term Care Act with respect to assistive devices to support individuals with mental health needs in their homes and communities. The bells will now ring for 30 minutes, during which time members may cast their votes. I'll ask the clerks to please prepare the lobbies. <laughs>